You're listening to the Today in Manufacturing podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Today in Manufacturing podcast. With me today are Jeff Frankie and Anna Wells. We each have about 15 years of experience covering the manufacturing industry. Every week, we take the five most popular stories on our websites and discuss the implications they might have on the industry moving forward. Before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by giving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, if you want to email the podcast, you can reach us at Jeff, Anna, or David at IN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. Anna, how was your Thanksgiving? It was great. I'm still a little drowsy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm drowsy, but in more of an alcohol way. <laughs> Jeff, how are you doing this night? It's good to know since you've got two small children running around the house that you just... Forget the turkey. Went straight to the uh, cocktails afterwards. They're huh? penned in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Good it to was, know. Yeah. Everyone's safe at the Manti household. Everyone's safe. It's a post bedtime cocktail. Just put an umbrella Singular. in the bottle. Yeah. Singular. Yeah. One bottle a day. That's it. All right. Uh, before we get started, I also want to thank everybody for reaching out uh, regarding the Today in Manufacturing T-shirts. We do still have a couple of those. Uh, if you're interested, please email us. Um, I also had the opportunity to hand off some in person when I was down in the Milwaukee area. So if there's anybody else in the Milwaukee, Madison area, just let us know. And hey, you might even get an in-person uh, delivery. Wait, say that again. So you're like ringing people's doorbells that ask I, for shirts and then just like, and we're not filming it. I didn't. Just uh, like we should have. Uh, well, currently doing this. There actually might be ring footage because <laughs> I saw that there was a ring on the door and I dropped the uh, drop, dropped it in the mailbox. And just the ring, uh, the light around it flashes. And mm-hmm. so there's just a lot of hokey pictures of me like, hi, thanks for supporting the podcast. And oh, my God. Just, yeah. I, why'd you use it, that voice? That I was mean, unnecessary. That was like in my head. I was just there alone. Oh. Yeah. Okay. No, that was just like as I was processing how weird my actions were while I was doing yeah, it. Yeah. If you're not comfortable with this, just <laughs> include a note that says, please don't come to my house, yeah. David. Yeah. If I'll cover the postage. <laughs> Don't come anywhere near my home. Yeah, we can send it in just a regular box. That's fine. Well, Pete, if I made you feel weird, sorry. <laughs> you made me feel weird just hearing about it. <laughs> this is like normal, though. All right. Let's jump into our first story this week. Samsung says it will build a $17 billion chip factory in Texas. Last week, Samsung announced plans to build a $17 billion semiconductor factory outside of Austin, Texas. Texas Governor Greg Abbott says it's the largest foreign direct investment in the state of Texas ever, and it comes amid a global shortage of chips used in everything from phones to cars. The company will start building the plant next year with operations scheduled to begin in 2024. Samsung says it chose the site because of government incentives as well as, quote, the readiness and stability of local infrastructure. Jeff, I understand that infrastructure is ready, but will this plant have any, I mean, it's going to be three years before this has any impact on the chip shortage. Well, I think when we look at the chip shortage right now, we're, we really gravitate towards the automotive sector. That's mm-hmm. where I think we, we get the most headlines and, and see the most impact right now. So many unfinished vehicles just basically sitting out on production mm-hmm. um, facility lots. So in that respect, you know, not immediate. Mm-hmm. But when you look at long term and avoiding this going forward, yeah, this is a huge, huge deal. Um and what I thought was really interesting, well, a couple of things. The first thing that caught me is the first reason they gave for choosing this location yeah. was the government incentives and the, the ability of local government to work with them. Reading between the lines, this is obviously going to be tax breaks. This is going to make the process of building and managing this facility much easier and smoother, you would think, with any type of – anything you need to do in terms of getting new construction project going. And then the $20 billion that they're spending there, all the jobs, the production that that brings to that area, that's huge. And it's obviously mm-hmm. a great – Thing. Yeah. Um, in terms of the impact on the automotive side, a lot of what Samsung does isn't exclusively focused on that. They're a little bit more diverse in their chip application um, production. But when you look at that, you look at this being in Texas, it kind of made me wonder a little bit with how far up this was really endorsed. And you've seen the Biden administration do a lot specifically focused on chip production and bringing some of that back to the U.S. It wasn't that long ago where the U.S. had third of the global production of of chips for computers, devices, cars, all of that stuff. That shrunk down to about 12% Mm -hmm. right now. So in trying to get that back, the Biden administration was heavily involved. 
they get these huge facilities going in. You wonder if there isn't the potential then for other things down the road to also come into this area that are kind of dominated right now by China from a production perspective. When you look at smartphones, smart appliances, Mm -hmm. um, things of that nature, is there the potential to also take those things a little bit away from China? Mm -hmm. Right now, we're in this sort of economic standoff. War might be a little bit harsh, but (laughs) definitely a lot of um, harsh words going back and forth in terms of battling China economically. This seemed like a real win not just for this area, but kind of for the U.S. and the Biden administration's focus on getting some of these economic elements away from China and Mm -hmm. here. Yeah. The other thing it made me think of, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was just going to say it's a war and not a standoff because you save that many characters in the headline. (laughs) There you go. Yeah. The other thing it kind of made me think of is back in 2013, Google bought Motorola. Mm. They came with the Moto X phone. Remember, it was a big deal. They were going to make it down in Texas. They were they bought this facility. They had, I believe it was, it was a Flextronics or something like that, a contract manufacturer that they were working with to, to build smartphones here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It lasted about a year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. did not take off. So on the one hand, it's great to see all these chip plants. It's, Intel is also building one. Micron made a huge investment. All these other folks doing this. It would be great to see it go beyond that. Mm-hmm. But also, are we built? Just is the U.S. ready to do that? Do we have the infrastructure to really take over some of these things that are primarily pro- prominently been built in China? Uh, Anna, what's your thought on it? I mean, do you see this being a temporary fix? That's a result, you know, sort of reactionary, or do you see this more as a overarching tr- change in the way we do business in the mm-hmm. U.S.? Yeah. I mean, I think that there are a lot of dramatic, maybe more permanent changes that are going to take place in terms of how people operate. Mm -hmm. Um, At the onset of the pandemic, there was a lot of talk about onshoring of critical components. And I think we're truly now seeing just how much we consider critical that maybe we didn't at the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, it's not about gloves anymore and and 95s. Mm -hmm. Like, look at the auto shortage right now and people thinking like, you know, how are we going to get out of this? Right. Um, you know, if you look at automotive, I, I read a report uh, this week that um, quoted a head at Daimler saying how fundamental the business um, would change, the automotive business would change based on this semiconductor shortage. So they're okay. talking about like, yes, long term. And this is new. Like, uh, so his name's Michael Brecht. Okay. And um, he heads Daimler's Works Council, and he told this uh, a German press agency basically that um, that it sounds like they're going to focus on disintermediation, which is you know kind of cutting out the middleman, right, for lack right. of a better way of saying it. It's a long word for that, but <laughs> um, he says in the future, vehicle manufacturers will purchase raw materials and key components themselves directly from the respective suppliers, and will no longer rely solely on the large suppliers as system providers. So it will be interesting to see, like, as these new fab plants pop up, mm-hmm. um, they begin to do more direct business with the end customers. Um, will auto supply distributors get cut out of the deal? Um, what else will this mean for how they operate? Uh, what were their will their inventory, you know, holding costs be like? I mean, that will change. Oh yeah. Will this kind of the strategy impact other industries? Will we see more of it in industrial? Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. It's interesting to see this happen. Um, they could have some big customer contracts right away mm-hmm. if, if you know, you know, say the big three are, are tired of dealing with the status quo and how they've done it now. Um, they want to be buying direct right from this plant or from Intel or from wh- whoever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it makes a lot of economic sense to do it. I, I think that they could recoup a lot of their investment costs relatively quickly. So we may see more of this, as Jeff said. Well, and Jeff, it's not just economical, but... Uh, this article talked a lot about how it deals with national security with U.S. companies being so dependent on chips produced overseas. I mean, it's obviously a concern. And we continue to see that with uh, Huhai, you know, and a lot of um, things that have come down from the U.S. in terms of restricting their access to our components, as well as us even thinking about bringing in their products to this country. So, yeah, it, it's interesting where it stops and where it starts. I thought what Anna also brought up about how these companies are going to get closer together I mean, maybe in the future you see these chip makers stationed within a Ford production facility right. or, or something yeah. similar like that, whatever way it makes sense, um, taking advantage of, of purchasing um, yeah. and quantity and things like that and some of those pricing breaks and also just simplifying supply chain. That's one of the biggest thing that COVID uh, has impacted. 
people just reassessing, does it make sense to source from here and build here? Do we want to put it all closer together? Which is why, again, more chip makers in the U.S. that could really lead to some interesting developments for other manufacturing down the line. Well, and it's not, I mean, it's, it kind of fits in with how automakers already operate, right? Where all their key suppliers are kind of really close regionally. Mm -hmm. um, when possible. When possible. Mm -hmm. When possible. And, you know, these chip manufacturers might just be the nucleus of what that new sort of campus looks like. Campus, I don't know, not com like in compound. Compound. Worse. <laughs> no. <laughs> Come to our industrial compound. All right. <laughs> our, no our next most popular story this week it's the great resignation for CEOs as well. A new report from Hydric and Struggles, a recruiting firm, suggests that the great resign resignation isn't only for the average worker. The number of companies who changed CEOs in the first half of 2021 are more than double that of Q3 and Q4 in 2020. The firm believes a switch to all virtual communication has been, quote, exhausting for executives, forcing many to seek a career or lifestyle change. Another possibility is that companies kept leadership in place during the instability of the pandemic and are finally willing to make a change. The recruiting firm thinks that the great resignation will continue with executives who delayed retirement during the pandemic finally pulling the plug. Anna, do you foresee more disruption going into 2022 in terms of uh, CEO turnover? I do, because the analysts say that's what we should expect. Um, <laughs> and I'm actually surprised it wasn't worse in 2021. Um, mm -hmm. You know, to me, it was interesting because we talk a lot about how the economy has changed and there's a big need for workers. There's a big need for labor right now. There's a challenge getting it right. But I think this report kind of touched on an interesting component of the hiring influx over the last six months or so that's a little bit more nebulous um, as far as an impact from the pandemic, which is I wonder how many of the new hires taking place now are pent up in the sense that people simply didn't want to make those decisions over Zoom. Oh, yeah. Um, we hired during the pandemic, as mm -hmm. you guys may recall. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we waited as long as we could. And mm -hmm. we did interviews remotely and as close as possible to the time that we were reopening the office because we didn't want to like engage in this protracted like remote onboarding process. And I think you have to kind of weigh the pros and cons, in my opinion, of starting someone from home. Right. Because you you know, they miss that cultural element. They miss a lot of tribal stuff. Um, it's harder to get a feel for the environment that they're in. Um, yeah. You know, most of us that were thrust into the remote environment, like we already had that foundation. We did our jobs already. We knew our duties, how to execute them remotely, or we could learn. But um, there's something plotting, I think, about remote training mm -hmm. uh, for the trainer and yeah. for the trainee, right? Yeah. And you just worry that like the person is just going to be kind of in this on this island and not feel connected to the team, and therefore they're starting out at a disadvantage. Oh yeah. Um, and I know we were all concerned about that, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not surprised that people wanted to wait until they could work through this process with fewer restrictions. And that obviously applies also to executive level, mm -hmm. because it looks like a lot of these companies were like, we're just going to try to get through the worst of this and then maybe make these significant personnel changes when we have a, a, a little bit more at our disposal in terms of like face to face interviewing, yeah. a little yeah. bit of onboarding in person. I just think that that makes a huge difference. But it's not something that everyone's really been talking about, that maybe some of this hiring is just stuff that's been sitting there waiting to happen mm -hmm. during the yeah. pandemic. Do you think the CEOs knew the writing was on the wall? For sure. For yeah. some of them. I mean, it sounds like this is sort of a mix between like CEOs who are being forced out now because the opportunity is better for their companies to replace them mm -hmm. versus also executives who are facing the same kind of burnout that the rank and file are facing and they're oh, yeah. just quitting. You know? Yeah. Well, it's, uh, one of the things about the pandemic is that we did work from home, but we're constantly creating things every day. So we we had things that we could make. Like, I couldn't imagine navigating a work from home situation if I was just a manager. You know, if, mm -hmm. if all you had, like when you talk about exhausting, if all you're doing are replying to emails, working on personnel problems, you know, like that had to be just incredible, like an incredible pain. And Jeff, you have experience managing larger teams before. If that was all you were doing from home was sort of putting out all these little fires and answering <laughs> every email, like I could see how that would get maddening. 
Absolutely. I mean, you can definitely see that part of it. I, I do think a lot of this was, like Anna alluded to, sort of a pent-up demand a little bit. Yeah. I think some folks hung on a little bit longer just because their company was going through a tough time. Maybe they had plans to step aside and they extended their mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. their tenure a little bit. I also think it's much more competitive for mm -hmm. quality leadership right now. Exactly. I think there's yeah. a lot of people that are willing to look outside their organization to bring in a stronger leader. We're seeing that a little bit. We've seen CEO pay raise excuse me, CEA, CEO pay rose by nearly 19% between nine, 2019 and 2020. 19%? 19%. Wow. So these guys are getting yeah. bank. Yeah, like it's, they it's are about time to. Paid. They've been so grossly I, underpaid so far. Yeah. So, <laughs> so obviously that makes it very competitive out there. People recruiting from other places, mm -hmm. people bringing people from outside. The other thing is, if you're getting paid that well, yeah, maybe two or three years and you're like, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. I'm out of here. I've been at the end of my career or close to it anyway. I've been doing this. I'm making good money. I can step aside and be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that may play a part. Mm -hmm. I think one of the more encouraging things, too, from this study and looking at it is that they're getting more diverse in terms of where people are looking to get their CEOs from. Right. Not just in terms of minorities and women, but also from different areas. They said mm -hmm. there was a much lower percentage coming from former CEO, COO, and CFO positions. Right. Drawing more from tech risk management, hmm. and even like, I'm going to go on a limb and say a lot of probably supply chain and sourcing people were also looked at very heavily in dealing with all the crap we've been dealing with for the last 18 months, which by the way, when you think about last March, doesn't that seem like about 10 years ago? Yeah. That does not seem like a year and a half, no. but for what people have been dealing with, um, yeah, I thought it was interesting how that's transitioned as well in terms of where they're looking to get new CEOs mm -hmm. and new leadership from. That's part of that uh, exhaustion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Living 24 hour days. Yeah. Um, no, I thought it was really interesting too that we saw uh, more women being hired into these roles, but I still found it troubling that women still only make up 6% of CEOs globally, but at least the US is number two with 12% of the CEOs being women. So a bit of room to go there. I also found it interesting that the average tenure for a CEO is six and a half years, just over six and a half years. But so and a part of me is torn because I mm -hmm. hear a number like 19% pay increase. And mm -hmm. it's just like, what's enough? But we've seen how bad CEOs, bad leadership can destroy a company in a handful of months. We have it, seen that. We have seen it. And it doesn't take long. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like from the first meeting, you're like, where is that resume? <laughs> it's dusty and it's going to need a polish. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no. So... What are your thoughts? <laughs> was there a question? And, and I got caught in a flashback there. She's like, oh, I remember yeah, that. Everyone, oh, no, not again. Excuse our Don't silence. Don't make me relive. As we're all in our shell shock. Yeah. Yeah, man, that was a bad mm. time. No, <clears throat> so I wanted to get your uh, mm. your thoughts on the uh, more women being named CEOs and still a lot of room to grow there, mm -hmm. but also in terms of the average tenure being like six and a half years. Yeah. I don't know if that's unusual or not. Um, I'm sure it depends on the company. I mean, you see a lot of these folks come in and they specialize in like turnaround scenarios and they only do these short gigs, you know, three, four years or whatever, and they figure it out and then they move on. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, maybe it's Maybe there's a lot of turnaround scenarios right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you can get bored with it too. Like you said, if it's primarily a management type role, you're not mm -hmm. really creating as much stuff. If you're basically, you know, fixing the boat yeah. <laughs> from sinking and getting it back on track, then maybe you do want, you just want to move on for something new, something different. Mm -hmm. I also found it encouraging slash maybe I should get it together because 25% were, uh, were appointed before the age of 45. Hmm. I'm just like, man, I mean, that's still pretty close, actually. It doesn't seem old anymore. It seems <laughs> close. It's not good. Um, but the average age were uh, 49 in terms of when they were appointed. I don't know. I just find stats like that interesting as to what the average CEO sort of looks like. Mm -hmm. I did find it kind of cool that they were going outside of traditional roles, you know, it wasn't just a CFO or COO being appointed, um, which, you know, kind of seems like a tired legacy. Um, I think that the tenure kind of goes into what well, we're seeing in product life cycles shortening. Like yeah. it's much more of a now things are changing more rapidly to adjust to consumer demands, regardless of what you're producing. I mean, just even in our jobs, we don't make an actual physical product, mm -hmm. but think about how things have changed over the last three or four years mm -hmm. in terms oh, yeah. of how we go about things and put things out. So that tenure, maybe being on the shorter side, could really be a reflection of the fact that everything is sped up. We're, we're going quicker, faster. We're burning through um, new ideas more quickly. Right. So maybe those folks do need to transition out, get some new blood in there, a different way of looking at sure, things. Yeah. Right. When a CEO, or a CEO leaves and says, it's just, I need a better quality of life. 
And it's just saying a lot about that company. <laughs> it's just like, it's been bad for a while, guys. <laughs> bad for a while. All right. <clears throat> Our next most popular story this week. Dead crew members stuck aboard cargo ships. On November 19th, the Wall Street Journal reported numerous instances of bodies of crew members who have died aboard cargo ships that had to be stowed in onboard food freezers. Restrictions at many ports as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic have prevented crews from unloading bodies suspected of being infected with the coronavirus. Corpses are reportedly stuck on cargo ships for months at a time. In one particular example, a captain of a cargo ship died in April, and his body was put in the ship's walk-in freezer where it spent six months. The company was denied by 13 different countries that refused to take the body and wasn't offloaded until October. Now, Jeff, I understand that there are a lot of difficulties and questions and ongoing changes with the managing the coronavirus pandemic, but that just seems miserable for every family and coworker involved there. Yeah, I cannot even imagine um, <clears throat> what that would be like. Number one, just those who are close to those crew members as friends and coworkers, mm -hmm. and then obviously for their their families who are just waiting to sort of get that final piece of, of what they need to move forward. Right. You know? So really, yeah, a very, very tough, awkward situation all the way around. Mm -hmm. The one thing, and I guess I should you know, preclude this by saying, I am not a health official in any way, shape, or form, but according to all the research I've done, unless you really go out of your way to like stick your finger in their mouth or up their nose, you cannot get COVID from someone who is deceased. Hmm. Right. Okay? okay. So a lot of this feels like a lot of these ports of entry because they're dealing with so much other crap right now, they just have not updated their ways of processing these mm -hmm. types of situations, mm -hmm. which is sort of understandable because there is so much going on right now from a logistics and supply chain challenge. But at the same time, man, this seems like an easier one to help people get past and move on with what they yeah. need to do day to day. And it's just really is updating those regulations. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other part of it is actually moving a deceased body mm -hmm. is really Difficult, it's just yeah. tough, because not only do you need a place to actually take it, mm -hmm. then you also need somebody who is actually approved to handle and ship that. Right. So you need to deal with like the, a funeral parlor or something like that on mm. both ends of okay. the situation. So it is logistically very, very challenging. And again, I think with a lot of these shipping companies dealing with so much other stuff, it's expensive, it's yeah. difficult. It probably, as kind of weird as it sounds, just goes to the bottom of the to-do list mm -hmm. yeah. because it's sort of managed well and there's yeah and there's so many other things going on yeah i mean you talk about some of the intricacies of it that are causing the problem mm -hmm. under the maritime labor convention insurance companies uh do need to contribute to the cost of burying or cremating a, de a dead seafarer however it doesn't say that they have to get the body home and another one of the issues anna was that you actually can't offload the body until you have a coroner come on determine how the person died and that's when you can make the move. Mm. So it was uh, reading the article in the journal, I just found a lot of interesting challenges for already understaffed crews. But it's okay for them to move the body into a freezer. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of the humanity elements of the supply chain crisis are really getting glossed over here. Um, you know, I think it's easier to focus on the goods and the shortages and, the ships waiting at port and how difficult it is for Christmas and blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. um, no one's really talking about how difficult it is for the people that are tasked with moving these container ships. You know, um, the Wall Street Journal ran an article last month about how the number of cargo ship crew members that are basically being abandoned at sea where the ship owners will just like they won't pay them or they won't pay to ship them back. Mm -hmm. It spiked last year and it's on track this year to be worse. Some of it comes back to what's happening in this report. Like ships are not being able to dock or unload. They're searching for ports to access. Um, the International Transport Workers Federation, which is the union for these types of workers, is calling the conditions a global humanitarian crisis. And the Wall Street Journal says that trade disruptions caused by the pandemic and the nature of the competitive, lightly regulated global shipping industry has helped drive the increase in the number of stranded sailors. And it sounds like part of it is due to like Heavy consolidation in this industry. There's a lot of the shipping is in the hands of like five or six companies. So these smaller outfits are under so much pressure to 
do this, yeah. um, that, that sometimes their debts get too high. They encounter a maintenance issue that they can't afford to fix something and they just leave their ships. Mm -hmm. They don't, you know, and so then the, these crews are like stuck out there. Um, so I don't know. I just think the story is just more evidence about how these people are being treated. Um, this supply chain crisis is terrible on so many levels, but the fact that there are human beings being just left out to sea. Yeah. Um, you know, I read reports of like some people being stuck for like months and months because yep. they can't always just come in. Even they're like very close to port, but they can't always just come in no, because they don't they have won't let them in. They won't let them in. Yeah. So they're eating like rice you know on mm -hmm. the ship they're trying to like get their money for like a year's worth of back wages they can't get their money um so uh the surge in this activity has prompted um china indonesia and philippines who are like the world's largest seafaring nations to propose the establishment of a sea seafarers mutual emergency fund to help abandon crews mm. i don't know where that has landed if yet but um it would be nice if somebody would try to take control of this problem the Anger was definitely there. Are quotes in the um, the article in the journal. Uh, one in particular was from the captain of the New Max bulk carrier, who said, "We are spending our lives here on board to bring the goods to your house. What do we get in return? We're not allowed to even be ill. We just have to die." So it sounds like a lot of the anger and frustration. I mean, I feel like it's been there for, I mean, six to twelve months already because some of these people, have, like you said have been stranded in these very terrible conditions for a while mm -hmm. without a real light to look towards. Yeah, it's pretty awful. Well, and we've, we've covered a lot of number of stories about safety incidents mm -hmm. occurring on these types of ships as well. Well, when you're not taking care of people and they have to worry about getting paid and getting food, it's not a surprise that those things pop up as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Our next most popular story this week. Fed sue truck maker for firing whistleblower. Truckmaker Peterbilt has been accused of violating whistleblower protection laws. The Department of Labor says the company fired an employee who raised concerns about its efforts to protect workers against COVID-19 at its plant in Denton, Texas. The company said it would clean workspaces but continue production as usual. After the employee pressed the matter with a local business group, Peterbilt fired the worker for disclosing trade secrets and poor performance. OSHA found that the company improperly retaliated against the employee, and the Labor Department has asked a federal court to order Peter Peterbilt to reinstate the employee, expunge the personal record, and provide back pay. Jeff, I was interested in getting your perspective, not only on the story, but, you know, after these whistleblower comp complaints go through and they're ordered to give their job back, you know, I always think about what it would be like to go back into that office. And it, or, you know, the facility. And it just seems like maybe the most awkward ever. Well, potentially. This is a very large facility. Yeah. I think it's like 2,000 people. 2,000 employees. Yeah. Um, working there. So in that respect, I think it could be easier. Mm -hmm. Plus, we don't know how everybody else felt. Yeah. I mean, the other folks that work in there may mm -hmm. have felt similarly. Uh, looking, doing a little bit more research, it looks like his primary concern was just social distancing. Yeah. Because that was one of the first things that came out. And this actually, I mean, this was right when it was getting going. Yeah. Right when it started getting hot in, in early March of last year. So he raised concerns about social distancing. It, this almost feels like there was something personal there or just an overreaction because somebody was talking about company business outside of the facility. Mm -hmm. Right. And somebody's feelings got hurt and they overreacted in a like a ridiculous manner, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. Firing the guy for that. It also came at a really weird time because you say Picard, is that how you say the corp, the parent company's name? Yeah. Um, Picard. Oh, actually, I don't know. That's why I just said Peterbilt. <laughs> <laughs> P-A-C-C-A-R. They own Peterbilt. They're the, the parent company. They own some other um, transportation manufacturing companies as well. They closed all of their facilities for two weeks mm -hmm. from March 24th to April 6th. They shut them all down because things were so crazy with the pandemic at that point. Right. So this worker's concerns were basically realized by the parent company a couple weeks later. Mm -hmm. yeah. So – yeah, bad. This just looks like bad management mm -hmm. all the way around here at this Peterbilt Peterbilt facility. And again, we've talked about this before. About this is sometimes it feels like management is just really out of touch with the current state of what workers are dealing with. And this could probably could have been fixed very simply by bringing the guy and saying, "Hey, man, we are dealing with it. We're trying to figure this out. Just keep it in the family. Let's yeah. the, we'll figure it out here. You don't need to go to the local chamber of commerce to sort of." air our dirty laundry. It definitely sounded like there was a lot of that frustration from both sides um, in the story where, you know, 
the worker wanted action and answers and the company was kind of like, we're figuring it out, man. You know, mm -hmm. because that was still at a time where people didn't know exactly what to do in terms yeah. of making uh, making sure that everyone was safe in the office. Um, the regional OSHA administrator, Eric Harbin, in Texas or Dallas, said, quote, every worker has the right to report safety concerns of any kind without fear of retaliation. And Anna, I read that statement and I just thought there will always be fear of retaliation. Yeah. And I think it's important to point out just how fine the line is between what's considered whistleblower type activity. Mm -hmm. um, because like the DOL re report says that this person was terminated after expressing their concerns publicly. And in this case, it was via a local business group. But for many, that public outlet, I think, is social media, right? Right. Uh, we've all seen it. <laughs> Um, in many instances, I believe your employer can fire you for sounding off online or elsewhere about your job. So what's the difference here? Well, because it relates to a workplace safety situation, it falls under protected activity. Okay. And that's fortunate for this employee who may or may not have known this, um, but likely their attorney did. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's not forget <laughs> that like the at will status of many of the nation's workers like means that they can be fired for... A lot. Any reason, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, most complaints are not considered protected speech. So maybe keep that in mind before taking it to the streets. Um, but, um, I, you know, I was kind of reading up on this because I was curious. Even if your comments are made on, like, so-called private social accounts, um, if they can be discovered and shared with your employer, you can be subject to disciplinary action, apparently. So that said, if your comments are about working conditions and they are, like, they can't be disproven – then you're in better shape legally. But, um, you know, even so, if you make insensitive public comments about things completely unrelated to your job, but if they're deemed to be like, you know, off color or offensive or insensitive, whatever, um, you can be fired and the National Labor Relations Board will like uphold that usually. Mm -hmm. So um, because it was safety related, this person was protected. Um, it's that's not always the case. Right. So even so, all he did, in my understanding, maybe mm -hmm. I maybe I missed something. He sent an email to the Chamber of Commerce, right? Right. Yeah. So because it was publicly recorded, I think that's why they were mad. But my point is that okay. most people feel comfortable, I think, sounding off, or they have you know sound off publicly via their social media accounts. That's you know that's another way yeah. that this stuff gets out there. And I don't think it people should necessarily feel safe like they're going to get backed up. Yeah, I don't um, think people ever think about the consequences of what they're putting on social media and how that can cost them their job. <laughs> right. Um, I agree. <laughs> so according to the Denton Record Chronicle, the employee reached out to the Denton Chamber of Commerce to see if anything was being done to address COVID-19 concerns at the Peterbilt plant. The chamber not only told the employee, bring it up with your manager, but then forwarded his email to the plant manager as well. So just really didn't put him in a good position. Well, that feels like a chain of command type thing, though. I think that that makes sense well, to because, me. Well, because, no, know. well, he was, uh, he went to his manager, didn't get an answer that he liked because, you know, they just yeah. said, we're going to clean, mm -hmm. you know, it'll be all right. Uh, didn't think enough was being done, so went to the Chamber of Commerce, and they're just like, I mean, this is the largest employer in the town also with 2,000 employees, so, I mean, I feel like the town, no matter what, is not going to sign with the worker. <laughs> it's just going to be like, hey, man, you got to go talk to them because we need yeah. Peterbilt. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It was just uh, that was the one thing that kind of stuck out with me a little bit where this person goes to the chamber looking for help. And they're just like, not only are we not going to help you, we're going to make sure your bosses know that you're trying to rock the boat. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, that's, that's, pretty... that's a good point, I guess. Yeah. So in the event that you have concerns, don't start with the chamber of commerce. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not even a second or third option. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Our most popular story this week. Domestic automakers rank, <clears throat> rank last in reliability. Consumer Reports has unveiled its annual brand rankings for auto reliability. The independent agency says Asian auto brands led by a wide margin with Lexus, Mazda, and Toyota in the top three for the second year in, the row, in a row. Consumer Reports uses a point scale from 0 to 100, and the average ranking falls within 41 to 60 points. Asian automakers have an average score of 62, European, average 44, and dead last are domestic brands, though not by a wide margin, but the average score was still 42 points. The only domestic brand to make the top 10 was Buick, which came in at number five. Last place was awarded to the Lincoln with only 18 reliability points, and just ahead was Tesla 
which earned just 25 points. Anna, what were your thoughts on domestic automakers doing so poorly when it comes to reliability? My first question is, what's a Buick? What? <laughs> yeah, have you ever even seen one of those lately? I uh, just bought one. You did? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> It'll be in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the parking lot? It's next. No. Oh, I hope no. it's parked next to you. <laughs> I hope it's parked next to your car. Uh, nope, we just bought an enclave. Congratulations. <laughs> um, I hear it's very reliable. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, look, I think when you hear the term reliability, you're thinking a vehicle deemed unreliable as like a bricked vehicle in your driveway. Yeah. But this composite score from Consumer Reports takes into account like all the bells and whistles, all like the new electronics and stuff. So companies like Tesla, who have built in a lot of fresh and emerging tech into their vehicles, like by way of non-critical features, I guess, like full self-driving, for example, they can really drag the score down here. Um, <laughs> yeah, and when we yeah. refer to domestic automakers, Tesla is one, even though we don't think of them, we think of like the Detroit 3. It's not just the Detroit 3. Tesla's Model X, we know, pulled this weight down big time. They just had an abysmal score. Five. They scored a five out of 100. Five out of yeah. 100. Yeah. But they said, the report said that part of it was their like for fancy gull wing doors that yeah. they have and also the full self-driving which we know is full of holes and bugs and stuff at this point but anyway um there's definitely something there in this report we saw obviously buick only in the top 10 um we also saw that domestic trucks and suvs are, are outperforming cars i thought that was interesting to note because we talked about this another time on the podcast um as sort of this chicken versus the egg phenomenon uh, you know, we keep hearing reports out there about how Americans no longer want small cars. Mm -hmm. um, but also, how heavily does automaker strategy influence that when mm -hmm. they are producing fewer models, doing fewer redesigns, and um, maybe the re reliability is worse, is yeah. what we're finding out? Yeah. I don't know. I feel like the incentive for automakers um, is like SUVs and trucks producing bigger profits. So do Americans not want to buy small cars or do automakers not want to make small cars? I think it's maybe a little bit of both. Um, yeah. And I thought this was an interesting data that kind of backs that up a little bit that maybe they're just not as focused on the quality there. Their SUV and pickups are kind of at the top of their list. Yeah. I thought it out. I thought it was also interesting that they came out and said it's because automakers are – not getting too creative, but you know, one of the big complaints was how people are trying to redesign the door handle. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, they don't work 100% of the time. And that causes a lot of complaints, which drags down the reliability yeah. score. And the one guy just said, just make a door handle that works every time, mm -hmm. you know? Well, that's a Tesla thing. Like their door handles get froze. Mm -hmm. Like you can't get it. Yeah. can't open the door. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is. And from a Buick yeah. driver, you just can't ha have that. Right. We've got pretty normal door yep. handles on the uh, the new vehicle. Yeah, yep. not a problem yet. Uh, <laughs> aside from your recent <clears throat> car purchase, congratulations. How did you find a car in this climate? <laughs> yeah, actually, that's a bigger question. We just got a really good trade-in value. Okay. I was going to oh, sure. I was going to need new brakes and tires, so I basically looked at it. That's the down payment. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I got good trade-in and yeah. there you well, go. Nice upgrade. Um, what were your thoughts in terms of, did you find it more reliable than your other options on the lot? Um, well, I mean, we had a GMC and we bought a Buick. So, <laughs> you know, and I drive a Nissan, I guess my everyday car. But um, I was actually a little bit surprised that this was this popular, this story was this popular on the site because we've been covering this for a while. Mm -hmm. I mean, this wasn't like breaking news that domestic automakers' reliability scores were lower than those, especially of uh, of the Asian folks, or the Asian automakers. So... I think what this really goes back to for me is the different approaches that these companies have taken to the U.S. auto market. Mm -hmm. Okay, when you look at Toyota and Nissan, it was the late 50s, early 60s where they really came into the U.S. auto market right from the start. They had smaller vehicles mm -hmm. that were more fuel efficient, that were built to last longer, but you sacrificed on the performance side of it. Mm -hmm. At that same time, it was U.S. muscle cars, yeah. okay? When you looked at what was coming out, if you opened the hoods on those two vehicles, if you opened up a Toyota, everything was pretty tight. Oh, yeah. It was very pretty compact. Everything had its place that kept the weight down and the fuel economy up. If you opened a U.S. vehicle that time, you had tons of room underneath that hood because they were bigger cars. They were made to be worked on. 
you bought that car knowing, hey, I'm going to be able to do my own stuff on this vehicle. I can, if I want to do something with a carburetor, if I want to put a blower on this motor, whatever it is, I can do that. That's not the way the imports were made at that point. Mm -hmm. And over time, as we saw fuel efficiency become more important, gas prices increase, mm -hmm. overall cost of just owning and maintaining a car go up, the imports were in a much better place than the U.S. automakers. And they've been playing catch up ever since. Because it seems like the U.S. automakers have always been focused more on performance mm -hmm. than reliability. They feel, you know what, it's going to last so long, people are going to buy parts to replace it. And that's the, way, that's the way our business model works. That's not the way the Nissans and the Toyotas of the world have gone about things. Mm -hmm. And as you can see right now, I mean, they're benefiting from that early approach um, right now. I wonder if we'll see some of this flip as... Uh, you know, Toyota has been kind of dragging a little bit with the EV going with more of the hybrid approach and some of the other automakers saying they're just going to go full in EV. I wonder if that's going to change. I'm sure that it will impact the list. I mean, they did like a special breakout on EVs, um, Consumer Reports did when they did this. And there's a lot of issues, but it's emerging tech. So you would expect that. But you'll, it'll be interesting to see like if it evens out or if it just well, wants you know, a full portfolio. I'm, I'm actually coming around a little bit to Toyota's thought there, because when you look at all the supply chain issues that are coming about with all these rare earth elements that are needed for the lithium ion batteries, man, you know, some of that hydrogen stuff doesn't look so bad. I mean, mm -hmm. if you can get an infrastructure in place to keep those vehicles fueled, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe they, they could, I can see where they could, they could see themselves having a competitive advantage with that type of approach. Yeah, no, agreed. Um, but I think also that Hybrid type, hybrid type approach is to, you know, give people that sort of safety net. Um, so the most reliable car is the Lexus GX. The Kia Nero EV was number two, which I found interesting that it was just a Kia. <laughs> um, Toyota Prius, uh, Prius Prime and the normal Prius. Cadillac <clears throat> XT5, the Mazda F MX-5 Miata, Honda Insight, Toyota Highlander, Subaru Crosstech and the Mazda CX-9 round out the top 10. The least reliable car, the Mercedes-Benz GLE. Oh, that is surprising. Isn't that surprising? I think that's also, isn't that what uh, boss man just bought Tool? <laughs> uh, isn't, uh, if the Tesla Model X or whatever got a, a five, a five, how is that not the least? I don't know. It got a five and there's it's not in the top 10. So I have to imagine that. What was crazy is that, the Ford Explorer, the Ford Mustang were number two and three on least reliable, followed by uh, the Silverado and GMC Sierra, the, the Chevy Corvette, Volvo XC90, the Volkswagen Tiguan, and then the Tesla Model Y was the eighth most re unreliable. Hmm. I think what may have skewed these, if you looked into their sort of um, procedures in doing this, it was a lot about owner complaints, oh, okay. mm -hmm. things that they, they you know obviously complain about. Yeah. So not maybe, enough owners. You could see a Mercedes Benz owner yeah. maybe complaining a little yeah, bit a more. A little bit more particular. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um number nine was the Chrysler Pacifica and then the Subaru Ascent, the 10 least tenth least reliable car out there. I always like lists like this where it's just like, all right, which brands are they gonna murder? Ooh, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Chrysler Pacifica, that's a minivan. I just, uh, uh -oh. it's, a, it's a bummer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just happy minivans are still out there. All right. <clears throat> let's move in. <laughs> let's move on to in case you missed it. Uh, some of the stories that weren't as popular on the site, which is understandable because it was a holiday week and well, a lot of them were unpopular. Yeah, I was not on our website either, everyone. So <laughs> yeah, it's OK. We didn't miss you either. No. <laughs> um. All right, Anna, I'd like to start with you. What's your, in case you missed it, uh, this week? Sure. So I got taken in by this headline. Um, invention lets people pay with a high five. Mm -hmm. In a time where high fives have fallen out of fashion <laughs> right. due to like rampant germophobia. Let's, uh, let's not do that. Mm -hmm. um, it feels a little out of touch. But anyway, there's more to it, apparently. So researchers at UCI's Henry Samueli School of Engineering detailed how they integrated advanced metamaterials into flexible textiles to create a system capable of battery-free communication between articles of clothing and nearby devices. So they liken it kind of to like if you use like tap to pay on your oh, credit card. Yeah. This would be like sleeve to pay. Um, kind of, I don't know. Yeah. It says that, that like the electronics establish signaling as soon as you hover your clothes over a wireless reader so they can share information 
with a simple high five or a handshake. <laughs> right. Um, but like the idea is from an application standpoint, like you would not need to unlock your car with a key. Mm-hmm. We know that that's a problem for me. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. Your body could be like your badge to open a gate if you were like needing access somewhere, say, I don't know. So um, I don't know. The whole like jacket starts your car thing is not uh, appealing Mm -hmm. (laughs) for so many reasons. Harder to lose your jacket. Yeah. Also, like, do you always have to wear it? Like, what if it's hot? I don't know. Like, (laughs) can you Then you're taking your bike. Can you change? Yeah. Or you just have to carry it around in the summer or can you change it to a different style if like your members only jacket? It needs to be like a shoe or something. Yeah. But I mean, even that, I mean, you're not going to wear the same shoes. Uh, I think in terms of uh, uh, smart clothing, mm-hmm. it's where all of it will have the same uh, data for you. I guess. I don't know. Like, It'll all be uh, linked with your Google Pay. So like your whole wardrobe? Yeah. So they talk about some of the applications I think that this is more useful for, which is like medical stuff. Um, if you had a hospital gown that could monitor your vitals oh, at all good. times, or if you were an athlete and you were wearing like pants that could track your heart rate and your leg movements or whatever. I don't know, that kind of stuff. So that that sounds interesting. Um, the designer said that it's meant to, quote, reduce the burden that modern electronics can bring to our lives. But sounds like it's also adding a burden, which is you have to wear the same shirt every day. Well, for the rest plus, of your couldn't life. I just be like acting excited that I'm happy to see David? Give him a high five yeah. and just like steal all his info. Right? Yeah, like aren't just you like, accidentally? I just got blown up on my Venmo. Like, <laughs> yeah. Jeff just robbed me. <laughs> hey, have a great day, buddy. <laughs> high five. Right? My God. Well, and aren't you Hacker. accidentally doing stuff all the time? Like how do you, how are you stopping it from starting your car if you don't want it? Like. I, I, just yeah. like I I'm was just, late today because I couldn't stop turning my car on. <laughs> I know I'm trying to get out of it. Uh, when I hear about the smart fabric, the one thing I also always think about is how kind of dangerous it gets because it's real close to being in an implantable. It's real close to being in body. Yeah. Because a lot of the inconveniences you're talking about, they're just like, well, you know, it would be a lot easier if it was just in your palm. Yeah. I mean, you got to get it out of your pocket. I mean, who wants to do that? Yeah. That's so hard. Think of how you never need to bring <laughs> oh, that jacket to start your car again. It's already in your hand. Yeah. just We're just going to brain it right in there. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then you are going to, yeah. No, I'm not into it. Yeah. I'm also not into the thought of like going to the grocery store and high-fiving the person behind the register. <laughs> do you high-five them through the giant fiberglass wall now? They do not so, want to do that, by no, the way. No, no one wants to do that. Yeah. They don't even want to take cash. So yeah, no. high-five would definitely be intrusive. They do not want to touch yeah. your hand, they scientists. Don't, they don't want cash, but there's a change shortage. So if you could help them out that way, just like, right. this makes no sense. <laughs> um, that is uh, interesting. You know, anything to bring more power to the high-five. Right. Yeah. So if anyone wants to write in and tell me what I'm missing here, please do, because I'm missing <laughs> something. I... Sometimes an application can just end at, huh, Yeah. that's neat. Mm. It's good that you can do that. I'm sure <laughs> there will be a need somehow. Some Someday. Someday, yeah. All right. <clears throat> My in case you missed it this week was NASA seeks ideas for a nuclear reactor on the moon. So NASA wants to put a nuclear fission power plant on the moon. The agency recently put out a request for proposals for a fission surface power system. NASA is working with the Idaho National Laboratory to establish a sun-independent power source for missions to the moon by the end of the decade. Vital, it'll be a vital next step in human space exploration. And if it works, the next objective would be to put one on Mars. Now, this reactor would be built on Earth and then sent to the moon. And it is no easy task. No way. All they're asking for is a uranium-fueled reactor core, a system to convert the nuclear power into mm-hmm. usable energy, mm-hmm. a thermal management system to keep the, nu- the reactor cool, and a distribution system providing no less than four, 40 kilowatts of continuous electric power for 10 years in a lunar environment. That's it! And it has to fit inside a 12-foot diameter cylinder that's 18 feet long, and it can't weigh more than 13,200 pounds, and be semi-autonomous, and they need the ideas by February 19th. Ooh, that is and coming up. And it needs up. to come in blue, right? <laughs> if you're just, it's got to be, in, it's got to match the NASA color scheme. They're not going to send something up there that looks SpaceX-y. No. Is, is this going to be what Bezos uses to run all those factories that we're also going to Well, that's what I was thinking. He's probably going to say he he already came up with this idea. Yeah. So. Oh, my goodness. If they win you're the contract. Welcome. Yeah. Like, uh, I said it first about uh, factories, right, guys? Yeah. You saw me. Oh, he's had a team working on it. Mm-hmm. He's like, actually, we have like four or five different ideas. You want to support those and... Just get the government to pay for it now. Oh, God. Um, 
I like this because I like the idea of, you know, um, further human space exploration. However, sometimes you read the proposal <laughs> and it just sounds like, really? We're not that close. Yeah. There's a lot to do there. It's just uh, the list of demands is amazing. So, you know, if you just got anything hanging out on a napkin that you want to scan and upload <laughs> as a PDF to NASA, uh, I mean, they'll probably give you hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop it. But, you know. So you got that going for you. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, any plans uh, for a nuclear fission power plant? I've got nothing there. No yeah. napkins in the drawer. No, uh, no nothing there. I have yeah. like a like a case of batteries. Is it less than thirteen thousand two hundred pounds? No, I have kids, man. Yeah, it's huge. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Even the rechargeable ones. Yeah, yeah. those are garbage. Garbage. <laughs> um, Jeff, what's your in case you missed it this week? My case, you missed it, is Apple suing a hacker for hire company. So I think, I don't know if any people, many, very many people have heard of NSO Group. They are based out of Israel. But you may have heard about Pegasus, which is the software that they have for hacking iPhones. Oh, yeah. Now, this is, I thought this story was interesting because what it feels like is potentially this Pegasus software came from a good place and now it's just being used for all sorts of bad things mm -hmm. because the company is basically saying, Apple is suing them because this software can break into their phones, get a bunch of personal and proprietary information and do with whatever you want. NSO is saying, we have this software out there because when basically when justice departments, law enforcement is looking to find people, find mm -hmm. criminals, see people doing bad things. They mentioned child pornography as one of the potential applications. This software allows them to get in to past any type of encryption or other um, personal security and basically find out what's going on. Now, the fact is this Pegasus software is pretty bad because it has been or it has been used in a lot of bad ways. I mean, NSO basically has already been blocked by the US Chamber of Commerce. There's a lot of other national, uh, a lot of other companies that have basically said, no, you're yeah. you're not you're not we're not letting you get in here. We're not letting you do this. We're not letting you sell the software. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting because Apple is going after them and suing them to basically take the company apart. Kind of shut them down, yeah. Yeah. So that they can't do this anymore. I thought it was an interesting context because again, it may have come from a good place. It's just being used for horrible things. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about companies having a certain ethical responsibility with their products. If you're smart enough to hack an iPhone, it seems like you could be doing some other stuff too. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. they're taking the route of least resistance here. And in this age where we talk about cybersecurity being such a huge part of industrial enterprises' approach to just running their business, making sure they're not getting caught into all these new IT scams that are out there, whether it's phishing, uh, ransomware, all that kind of stuff, um, just another thing to pay attention to. And in this instance, Apple could be doing a lot of people some big favors mm -hmm. and going yeah. after them. Yeah. No, it's, uh, uh, I know that we, I always say sometimes we just, you can never have nice things, yeah. but it's uh, something great like that comes out and then it's just incrementally to the dark side. Well, and this is one of those, again, basically the way that this software is usually downloaded or attacks a phone, it's through an app. So you can't even tell what you're downloading or one of those spammy like um, text messages that you get. Oh. So if somebody clicks on that or just opens it to see what's going on, responds to it, mm. Pegasus is in there doing its thing. Mm. So people are trying to hit me with that at least twice a day. Don't do it, David. Yeah. Don't click through. There's an exclusive offer I was just sent to take advantage of Cyber Monday. I need to strike while the iron is hot and before this deal expires. <laughs> Don't use your phone. Yeah, no, just got to stay off of that thing. Uh, Anna, any thoughts on the hacker for hire other than it being just like a cool name for a company? Hacker for hire. Yeah, yeah. I like it. Um. No, I mean, to Jeff's point, like, you know, big tech takes a lot of flack for mm -hmm. like antitrust stuff and just their, the leverage that they have. But in cases like this, they also have very large budgets for legal work. And um, like Jeff said, I think that they this is a net benefit for everyone. Yeah. I feel like once Apple has you in their crosshairs, it's probably not a good spot to be. Well, it's kind of ironic, too. Facebook is actually going after these guys, too, oh. because, you know, Facebook is a protector of personal data. And Yeah. Man, now yeah. I don't trust it all of a sudden. <laughs> now I don't trust it. Just like, wait a second. Facebook's against it. They must be good. Yeah. Do you think Apple is kind of like, hey, we, we got it. Yeah. Thanks, whoa, whoa, whoa. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. We're yeah. good. Keep your PR nightmare in the corner. We don't want your high five. So, <laughs> that's how they'll get you with Pegasus. Yeah. They'll just get you with a high five. That's next. the next next step. All right. Uh, before we get out of here this week, let's go on to our final thoughts. Uh, Anna, what's your final thought this week? 
Um, I was thinking that this week we should do as many taste test videos as possible because my stomach is a new size after Thanksgiving. <laughs> I stretched it right out. So I can do like back to back, whatever. Yeah. yeah, let's do these. So folks, be on the lookout. We got a lot of food in the studio that we need to taste test. That's right. I just got a box of pretzels mm -hmm. and a another box of frozen fruit. So we can, I mean, we can, you know, sweet and salty. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, let's do I'm 100% on board. I love our taste test series. Um, despite, uh, people watching our Arby's vodka taste test and just thinking that my reaction suggests I can't handle my liquor when it just means that I'm at a certain they're level not, now. They're not completely wrong. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you can't. Well, yeah. well, it wasn't like we shot it over three hours. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, it was just an immediate response to how horrible it smelled. Um, yeah. Jeff. What is your final thought this week? Final thought is how my Thanksgiving has changed a little bit. Usually I always look forward to football. Mm -hmm. And I started watching the football games and then just got dragged into like with all the streaming content that's out there. Mm -hmm. I just oh, thought yeah. I'd switch over. And before I knew it, like the football games were over and I had watched Tiger King again. Oh, yeah. boy. Bears-Lions was not a very exciting game, though. No. And like the Cowboys-Raiders game, that was a good game. But like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Just with all of this other stuff there is out there to consume – if it's not the Packers or Badgers, uh -huh. like it just takes a back seat for some reason. And Tiger yeah. King Two was excellent. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I've, uh, That'll be the next podcast. Just breaking that down. It oh. raised more questions than answers, you guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm on episode one, and I'm just like, I don't. I got to take these one at a time, <laughs> one at a time. There's too much coming at me. Um, no, I do, uh, and I really appreciate everybody sort of sticking around an extra day before we release the podcast because it was, you know, we were kind of stuck in whether or not we do it the week before and everything is potentially dated and old or just put it out a day later. So uh, we, apolog we apologize for that. And uh, thanks for, you know, checking it out the next day. I hope that everybody else had a good holiday. Um, you know, yeah. we do at our house uh, or the houses, our homes I was at, we keep football on the background, but with so many small kids running around, it's just, I mean, it was three nothing in that Raiders game. And then the time I looked up again, I'm like, <laughs> overtime, huh? In the thirties. Just, uh, <laughs> I feel like I missed a lot. I didn't realize we built that many Mr. Potato Heads. Like, just, I mean, my aunt had a tote of Mr. Potato Heads. It was glorious. That sounds fun. It was very fun. Also, if you think I'm the weird one in the family, we just got a whole tribe of them. My goodness. <laughs> and uh, did, once they, you, did they go with you to deliver the t-shirts? Um, <laughs> no, but I'll ask them to see what they think to kind of put them on the spectrum of weird. She's like, no, it sounds like a great idea. Wasn't good. Wasn't good at all. Um, no, it was just um, for me. It was a good time to be with family. That you know, a lot of times I feel like as we've eased on COVID a little bit, people are still kind of a little uh, cagey as to what they're comfortable with. And this was a nice one where I got to see a lot of the family and sit down and have a nice meal. And you know, it was a uh, it was a really good time. Mm -hmm. was really yeah. sometimes you gotta uh, take a step back and kind of remember what's important and everything. You know? No, it was great being able to get together with the family on Thanksgiving. Couldn't do it last year. Did it this year. Yeah. So that was awesome. Yeah. That was uh, that was the only, like, I didn't have an excuse to make like a 20 pound turkey for my family of four. That was <laughs> 23. What? I made a 23 pound turkey. Oh, Still got some left. Yeah. Bring that in. <laughs> bring that in. <laughs> we should taste test leftovers. I crushed this turkey. Don't That's good stuff. hate that idea. I don't hate it. All right. Before we get out of here, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. To email the podcast, ask for a Today in Manufacturing shirt. You can reach any of us at Jeff, Anna, or David at IEN.com. I haven't updated this document, so you could ask Andy at IEN.com, too. <laughs> I'm sure he'll respond <laughs> with uh, email the podcast in the subject line. Uh, you could also make sure you get, uh, if you subscribe to our daily and weekly newsletters, you'll make sure that you get the podcast in your inbox first. All right. For Jeff and Anna, I'm David Manti. This is the Today in Manufacturing podcast, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Today in Manufacturing podcast.